One of the greatest singer-songwriters of his generation, Rufus Wainwright, has been a pop icon since the release of his first album in 1998. He's the son of renowned folk artists Kate McGarrigal and Loudon Wainwright and has been playing the piano, singing, and composing ever since he can remember. His distinctive style is shaped by his musical family, a love of opera, and a plan to stay original. It was a little bit my naivete and keeping myself a little dumb that let me develop my own style because everything became this kind of mountain that I was climbing so I could take each step by discovering it as opposed to just following a path. So that's kind of how I created my sound, was a little bit through ignorance, actually. <laughs> You're listening to Speaking Soundly, a backstage pass to today's biggest stars of the music world. I'm your host, David Krause, principal trumpet of the Metropolitan Opera. During each episode, you'll hear me speak with inspiring performers about their creative process and the personal journey that led them to the stage. I got an email from your people last night asking to push our talk later just because you wanted some more yeah. time in the morning to practice. Yes, yes. And I laughed because eh. I was also really stressed about getting enough time to practice in today <laughs> before tonight's performance. Do you always practice yeah. first thing? Well, first, I'm, what, what are you performing tonight? Oh, tonight is Aida. Okay, okay. So I'm really curious to ask you, what does Rufus Wainwright practice in the morning? Well, you know, especially with piano, playing the piano, I, I feel the need to every day kind of commune with the instrument a little bit. Because unfortunately, I wasn't by any means a kind of diligent student when I was growing up. My mother actually forced me to play for many, many years because she, she knew I had talent and I also had certain musicality. And uh, but let's just say my technique wasn't great. But I, I kind of kept at it. She kept me at it. But in the interim, I loved composing rather complicated arrangements with the piano. I mean, I enjoyed all the different harmonies, all the different kind of interior lines. So I would just take a tremendous amount of time to compose <laughs> these accompaniments for songs. And then eventually I'd have to practice them a lot because they were not so easy to play. So it's, it's kind of like a roundabout way <laughs> of becoming a better pianist that I've devised. And also as I get older, you know, there's more repertoire that I've composed. So I want to kind of remember what I have. I've kind of tricked myself into having to practice. I don't enjoy it necessarily. I mean, I, I enjoy it when I get into it, but I have to force myself. In fact, in the, the mornings are really the only time when I could just go and do it without having to like force myself. Um, maybe that's also the fact that I have, you know, we now have an 11 year old daughter. And right. so while, you know, while you're, while my husband's doing all the school stuff, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I can go and practice now. But I do find just as a musician, it's good to do it, you know, just to, to commune, I guess. Earlier in the day keeps me going on many levels. What strikes me about that is that you set these musical stakes in the ground and it sounds like these morning sessions are for you to catch up to you, like that yeah. song, The Dream, that yes, you play. Yes. That, that sounds like, at parts like Liberace, at parts like yeah. Vladimir Horowitz. And, yeah. and were you inspired as a kid by virtuoso piano playing? Yeah, I mean, I. it's funny because speaking of Aida, you know, my great love of opera, starting with Verdi's Requiem, when I really came into contact with that piece, you know, everything changed. And I subsequently was obsessed with opera. But that being said, earlier than that, it was really Chopin. And then I would, you know, listen to certain albums because we had a few at home. And that, to me, was, was the most musical thing I'd ever kind of experienced. And also kind of related a lot to, to, to different types of music that was around, like folk music. In the, it wasn't that far from certain folk songs that my mother would sing or certain, you know, Judy Garland numbers or whatever that I was into, you know. So I think Chopin uh, was the beginning of that um kind of sense that pianistic sensibility and what were your first memories of singing yeah well singing i i don't have any first memories of singing because i was singing all the time you'll be one of the few people who understands this uh because unless you're a musician you don't really get what i'm saying which is that apparently according to my mother and i'm i'm a little dubious about this because <laughs> it's a little because after having a kid now it's it sounds really outrageous but uh, she says that when I was six months old, she would go, oh, McDonald had a farm. And I would go, E-I-E-I-O. And then 
She would go, Old MacDonald had a farm. I go, E I E I O. I would really? modulate. <laughs> so, which in a funny way, I think she's probably exaggerating. Though kids at that age, one one year old kids to like six or seven, what they're able to do is pretty astounding. If they're yeah. if if they're um, given the opportunity, I don't doubt that. Yeah. <laughs> One bit, you were born a prince into this musical family, not yes. only your mother, but obviously your father. Yeah. Music is well entrenched in your DNA, but you were also, as you said, raised with music on a daily basis. Yes. In terms of nurture versus nature, which do you think had a bigger impact on your musical outcome? Um. Oof. It's so hard for me to figure out because I was so gung ho about it uh, right off the bat. Um, as I said, I was singing all the time, and and I was always you know thinking in musical terms, um, writing you know and drawing and stuff. But so it's, and I had this you know receptacle uh, that was ready to go you know with with my mom especially. Um, I would say actually nurture is the most important. There are so many people who have such incredible talent but unless you really have someone driving you and paying attention and wanting to uh you know support you it's somewhat of a fool's errand i i, I think you can find those play people outside your family too i mean it doesn't all happen necessarily when you're really young like when you're a teenager even or even later maybe in your 20s maybe i mean there's a point where you have to where you need time like for instance like a lot of opera singers i i know have only knew that they like they suddenly in their late teens suddenly realized they could become an opera singer and it was like this huge shift from an otherwise non-musical family so it does happen but it's really that support behind you that is that is fundamental i think yeah it sounds like you had both yeah 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 are most of your childhood memories based in music like whenever i hear yeah. you talking about growing up yeah. they're all musical stories yeah i think the musical aspect was highly present um it wasn't all of my childhood memories it, 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 it by no means but nonetheless it was this kind of uh goal that was always repeating itself there was a, a pattern that had developed because my grandmother who was very musical. She loved to perform. So every time we would visit her, there was like a little show that would happen where all the grandkids would have a number and my mother would sing songs. And, and, and the end of the show was always my grandmother's doing a couple of kind of dirty 19th century <laughs> numbers. And and so so that was a regular kind of gig that, that existed in our family. And I think everything kind of gravitated towards that expose, shall we say. And that took the temperature of a lot of things. Having that in every, almost every weekend was great. And during those shows, were you right in the front row? And I was the bread and butter, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, my cousins would sing certain things. And my mother would sing a lot. The thing with my mom is that I cannot stress enough how amazing she was in terms of the musical journey. Like, whenever someone came to the house, she would always go to the piano and see what they could sing or see what their voice was like. Or if she heard a song on the radio, she'd come home and she'd try to figure it out or... Or she would go to like sheet music stores and look for weird old pieces that uh, that were kind of hidden gems and stuff. Like she was she was totally obsessed with music, almost to a fault. I mean, it never ended with her. So a lot of it comes from her. Did your mother have formal musical training? Yeah, I mean, she she studied with the nuns in the fifties quite extensively. She then went on to really become a virtuosic uh, kind of jammer, you know, like she would play the blues and play the banjo and, you know, with friends and stuff. And she could really pl play the guitar. She was a great guitar player. So she really went on to a more sort of, you know, I guess popular where music was, was about hanging out and creating together with people. So so she went into that road. But, you know, in the morning, for instance, she would play the Goldberg Variations. She would play me the Goldberg Variations to wake me up as opposed to put me to sleep. <laughs> like a <laughs> record is, or she would play them? No, she would them play them. She, would oh, play wow. them. she wouldn't play them all, but she would play quite a few of them in the morning. Um, but she had had some training, and uh, but she really was able to kind of jam with people and, and, and really play music uh, for fun at parties, which I always admired a lot. And I read that your mom 
would take you out of bed when you were a little kid yeah. to end the parties yeah, that yeah, they were hosting yeah, to yeah. sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When everybody was, it was pretty late and everybody was three sheets to the wind. And, you know, I had to sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And that was sort of like the, a way of, you know. That was like when the bar lights go on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get the kid, he'll sing. Do you think you were seen as like this tremendously gifted prodigy kid or was it just a cute no kid? no they they knew that i was gifted i would say that some people were a little put off by what was going on occasionally too like me having to sing all the time and her always trying to put me in front of everything you could see a few eyes rolling you know like oh here comes kate with her son again a little bit i mean they knew that i was good but it was also like it was it was a slightly um unnerving <laughs> uh, a little bit too but it, it is what it was one thing that I realized later on is that when I read about other people's lives and other artists that I like people like Cole Porter or Noel Coward or Tennessee Williams like all these different people they all had incredible mothers I mean that's like a really common thing especially for the gay ones I mean Truman Capote I mean they're always there's there's this mother figure that's just ready and waiting and and prepared to you know go all the way and i had that i was very lucky to have that in terms of writing songs was that just a natural extension of your musicianship like or was there a marked yeah. time that you said okay i'm gonna actually write yeah. a song um no i mean it was always expected that i would write songs only because that's what everybody did and in fact it, it developed to the point where um it, it was its own sort of language uh you know, I knew more about my father through his songs than through any conversations I ever had with him. Um, I knew w way more and probably too much about my parents' relationship because um, they, they would sort of write about each other. And and so it, I was just kind of continuing this narrative that had already been set. And it actually wasn't set by me. It was mostly set by... It was set by my grandfather on my father's side, by Loudon Wainwright Jr., because he... Though he wasn't a songwriter, he was a very well-known columnist for Life magazine. And he would had a famous column called The View From Here, which was very well-known in the 60s and 70s. And it was all about his life. And he would write about his kids, and he would write about his his world. And, uh, and so that was also this biographical, um, artistic way of, of, of communicating that I kind of got hit by on both ends. When you were writing songs, did your parents chime in and criticize? Or, uh, my and mother were you, did. Were you open to that? My mother did. My father yeah. had, he was off on his own journey. But my mother was, was, was really um, very attentive to the songs. And I would also listen to her songs. It was a kind of um, exchange. And, uh, and she was very critical. And I always appreciated that fact because... That's the hardest thing to get in music or any any art form is someone who's critical of you. Because it's when they're critical of you, that's when you know that they believe you can do it, that they're willing to roast you a bit because they know that that's what it takes in order for you to go to that next level, you know? It's always the artists who have everybody, you know, fawning over them that, that are kind of the most in trouble. <laughs> yeah, but that's not often your mother. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, she was br she could be brutal, and that's okay. I want to talk about your voice for a minute because okay. musicians start off with an artist who they really admire. They copy that until they find their own voice. Did you have a musical north star in this respect? Mm. Um, well, I mean, for me, the, the, Nina Simone was major. Uh, basically because she was the first artist that kind of gave me the idea that you could combine all sorts of genres of music and do it all with just the piano and the voice, you know, and, and that relationship between the, the two instruments. And um, so, so yeah, Nina Simone was, was, was a big influence. Um, obviously, you know, Judy Garland's singing has always fascinated me. Um, but I would actually say one of the, I think the greatest singer, uh, or, or the one that I'm I'm constantly impressed by, and who I try to imitate more now, uh, is is actually Peggy Lee. Her exactitude and her economy uh, 
is really, really brilliant. So uh, huh. I appreciate that a little bit more now than a, a whole slew of opera singers. Sure. Yeah. Your voice and your songs all have such a unique sound that is unmistakably you. Did it take a while to find your voice and separate it from those yeah. that you were chasing? I mean, I hate to say this to someone who's obviously gone through the system and has done well. For me as a composer and a songwriter and and, and the way that I play piano, I gained a lot from not going through the system as much. I mean, I was in it. I went to conservatory. I took piano lessons for years. I was never very good. But that being said, I've always maintained my love and my passion for it and my admiration for those who know really what they're doing. But it was a little bit my naivete and my kind of keeping myself a little dumb that let me develop my own style. Because everything became a discovery. Everything became this kind of... A mountain that I was climbing. So I could sort of take each step by discovering it as opposed to just following a path. So uh, that's kind of how I created my sound was a little bit through ignorance, actually. <laughs> which uh, which I, I don't think is, especially for composers, not so much. I mean, look, if, you're, if you want to be a great trumpet player or great pianist, I can really play those works. You've got to study and you got to do that whole thing but i think as a composer we have to think a little bit outside of the box here or th you know or put yourself through situations that aren't so predictable because that's where you become unique well speaking of being in the box yeah in high school you went to interlochen arts academy yeah, which is yeah, a yeah. summer camp in michigan i yeah. actually went there too oh, and yeah, i know we're yeah. about the same age so yeah, it's we very were possible there. that we were yeah. there at the same yeah, time yeah i had a pretty intense summer there what was your experience like i mean i took piano lessons and i did a lot of art um and i but i kind of slacked off a little bit but i would like for instance go to the that listening library and listen to strauss operas and i would go to a lot of the rehearsals a lot of the concerts there's something really really valuable about just being there even right. if you're not doing the work but just to being around that and seeing other kids one of the you know you know it's really funny is that we might have actually been in this same class <laughs> now that i think about it because there was one seminal moment that really stuck with me and you may even i bet you were in this class because there was a lot of horn players it was a composition class and there was some guy i remember he had a mustache uh, and he was a very good teacher i think and everybody was talking about Mahler. You know, they're like, oh, I love Mahler. Mahler's so cool. And they were all like going on and on about Mahler. But then at some point, Johann Strauss came up, you know, the Waltz King. And some kid said like, oh, yeah, he's terrible. Like, I never, I all that stuff is crap. Like poo-pooing Johann Strauss. And the teacher was like, wait a minute. <laughs> he wrote great music. And if you could ever get anywhere near what he accomplished musically, you will be ever so lucky <laughs> you know <laughs> you went from there to mcgill to yeah. study uh yeah. and were you basically on track to become a classical composer i don't know i mean i i did so badly when i got to mcgill i mean I, I, it was so not what i expected in terms of um you know a kind of creative place and uh, you know an aspiring place to make music it, it was so rigid and cold so I, I lasted about a year and then and then I left and I didn't I, I knew that in terms of becoming a composer I think I gave up at that point but opera just kept nagging at me you know opera is still my main source of inspiration and my main love musically and, and it stayed with me you know in my songwriting and I would go to the opera all the time and and eventually I just wanted to give back to that form. So I so I composed, you know, my first opera, now my second, and now there's talks of other ones. So yeah, it, it, I guess it was meant to be. <laughs> you said that the Metropolitan Opera in particular is uh, one of your favorite places in New York. Yeah, when yeah. you were growing up, when was the first time that you were there? I went to see a production of Louisa Miller when I was around 13. It was with my mom. And, uh, and actually it was kind of a well-known evening because that night, the tenor lost his voice and they had to replace him in the middle of the opera. It was kind of like going to a, a football game or something. <laughs> you know, they had to like get, bring they in another... Pull the quarterback. Yeah, right? yeah. And I kind of love that about it because opera can be that. There's a f sports element to it. You know, like, are they going to hit the note? Or are they going to, 
you know, are they going to make you cry? You know, whatever. <laughs> right. And there's cheering and booing. Yeah. Uh, which yeah, uh, which is uh, kind of exciting. Yeah. I know that you've written two operas. And yes. quite frankly, I'm still holding out hope that I'm going to get a chance to oh. play in the orchestra for one of them. Because yes. that... I'm not, it was it around 2010 that, that Prima Donna was on? Yeah, what happened is that the, the Met commissioned the opera. Right at that time, too, my mother was diagnosed with cancer, what ended up being terminal cancer, and and then things fell apart with the Met, and then the opera had to go to the Manchester Festival in England, and what would have been a four- or five-year process turned into one year. We had to do it in one year, and my mother got to see the opera. So that's kind of like cosmically what I think was going on. Fantastic. You know, so 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 it's in the end it was it was for be- for the better. Your songs are incredibly operatic. That's what drew me to your music in the first yeah. place. Not only your writing, but when you sing, do you feel like <laughs> an opera singer or a yeah. cabaret singer or a pop oh, star? Oh, well, I, when I sing it's I I sing like an opera singer. Where it's kind of all or nothing. Each time you sing an aria it's like your life should depend on it. There's a kind of intensity that the music demands, which in opera you have to just you have to devour the music really fully. All the parts of it. It can never be thrown away because it has to take every little bit of you. It's kind of all or nothing. Your music is intensely personal. Yeah. And I mean I feel like I know your life because your catalog is basically a roadmap of it and you really wear your heart on your sleeve yeah but yeah. outside of music are you transparent all the time or does music provide you that outlet to communicate in a way that you normally wouldn't be able to <laughs> i don't know that's an interesting question um i mean once again it uh, it boils down to my parents in the sense that and this is something i think you, as you get older you become more aware of that, that you become your parents in in certain ways and my parents were real polar opposites. My mother was incredibly open with her feelings, um, very, perhaps even a little too much so, very expressive, very engaged, and and so forth. And I feel that stream, you know, often rise up, and I want to tell everybody everything and cause have an effect. My dad is like such the opposite. He's a total wasp, a white American baby boomer, um, shut. I wouldn't say shut down, actually, that wouldn't be fair, but like really tight. And uh, <laughs> and and to be fair, you know, I mean, for a long time, I, I faulted that with him. But now as I get older, I'm like, no, there's something to be said for, you know, holding your cards close to your chest and, you know, being a little more cold about things. It's uh, it has its place as well. So so I'm I'm really stuck between these two extremes. Yeah, that's where I am. Once you write a song about a part of your life, you know, for a lot of us that don't archive it yeah. that way, aside from photos or the people yeah. that affected you at the time, decades ago, that's that's a distant memory. But when I listen to a song of something that you went through yeah. 20 years ago, yeah. uh, it's very real for me. Does that bother you at all? Like knowing that I have this this oh. knowledge of something that you were dealing with that? No, I mean, I, I, I mean, once again, in dealing with these two extremes, one of being like really expressive and one of being actually quite um, formal and, you know, detached, is that is that the songs are imbued with real emotion and and from real experience, but there's also a structure to them. You know, there's also they're called also kind of built in a way that's architecturally, you know, sturdy. And so I I think that that's actually kind of key. Is that on one hand, yes, I mean it's great when you're when you're letting it all out and being kind of over the top and you know honest about your feelings, but but if it's not done in a way that's um you know, that's that's architecturally sound. Um, it doesn't really have the effect, the desired effect. All kind of, once again, straddling those two things. Right. When you write a song, it must be a great feeling once it's done and you've played it for yourself. But I'm curious if that feeling is heightened once you perform it for someone else. Does anything change about the song oh. itself the minute you play it for anyone else? The big thing that I I look for, and this is big actually, and this and this I feel is a tip actually that I would that I would share with a, a young songwriter. It's wait for them to come to you, um, and I do this a lot with my husband, Yorn. There'll be moments I'll be playing things, 
and and it's, it'll, it'll just be like wafting through the house and you know he won't pick up on it but then there'll be like a certain melody and i'll be like what's that and um and i know at, at that moment that something's going on and then i share it with them and mm. then i play it and i get into it but there's something in letting the music do it for itself that can be really helpful and just in knowing if this is any good or not if it can just sort of permeate without sharing it at first having it sort of have its own you know journey right and I, i'm assuming that the songwriting process it it takes a while. It's not just, it's you know, it's not just a day. Yeah. Are you ever a little nervous to let it be heard by someone else? Or once it's done, it's done? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a brutal experience, really kind of sharing it with someone or, or even an audience for the first time. But I think that's coupled with this strange need to, uh, you know get those emotions out and, and get on to the next project. You know, I am listening back to a lot of my older material and, and really early demos and stuff. And and I can definitely see how, you know, without this sort of half-baked composition, you know, the, the two songs later, I wouldn't have come up with one of my better known kind of numbers. So so I think I think in the end, it's, yes, it's hard to, to, to express it. But I think I know intent and inertly that behind the, some of those songs are some are some big numbers, um, and I just have to keep the flow, you know, keep the what is it, the assembly line going. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, it's funny. Every once in a while, I'll hear a recording we did at the Opera House maybe 15, 20 years ago that I was playing on, and it's really interesting to hear what I sounded like back then versus the way I play now. Do you ever listen? Yeah. to something that you've sang or performed uh, a couple decades I, I, ago? Yeah, I'm a much better singer now than I used to be. I mean, I mean, there's there's some brilliant moments when I was younger where all the kind of forces of the universe were colliding and, you know, my ambition and I was in the right place at the right time and the tone in my voice or just an excitement that I'll never be able to replicate. That being said, about half of it is terrible, I think. Just the way I'm singing, like the breaths I'm taking. Some people find it very endearing because I'm sort of so exasperated and so, you know, over the top about it. But it was really only after I did the Judy Garland shows that I really concentrated on my singing. And um, and now I think I'm, I'm a much better singer than I was. So I kind of cringe when I hear a lot of early things. But then there's other ones that are special too. In, the, in that process, was it training or just experience that you think led to you being a better singer? It was just singing a bunch of different things. As I said, the Judy Garland stuff, or I, I also sang classical uh, works. I sang a lot of Berlioz, sang, a, sang some Schubert. Yeah, and imitated, you know, my favorite singers. And also, I have to say, you know, quitting drinking was also big because alcohol really was bad for my voice. It's not bad for all voices, but there was definitely something going on there that that wasn't helpful for me. So there was that. And, and then I think also just life experiences, whether it's with songwriting or singing or composing, I am able to sort of absorb what's going on around me and then translate it in these different ways. I'm very, and I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. Yeah. When you sing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, it's it's one of your biggest encores. I know that you do it a lot. You do it with the same conviction and passion as a song that you've composed yourself. Right. Do you feel any more or less connected to other people's music that you're interpreting versus the music that you've written yourself? Is there any difference at all to you? Well, I mean... It's a completely different animal for me. When I get become the role of the singer, you are kind of shape-shifting into this other being. Um, you know, it's interesting because I'm i working on a musical now and we had an experience recently where I, we had actors singing some of the songs of mine and then I got up and sang one of the songs and everybody was kind of floored by it. But, and the director was like, it's kind of, unfortunate because you're singing it way better than anybody else and he says i love the song but the kind of the double whammy of the way you sing it and the fact that you wrote it is it's hard to like it makes it more complicated and and he said and and what we decided in the future is that i should work with the singers what do you what do you tell a singer that is singing uh, one of your songs well we'll see we'll see we'll see we're gonna get it that that's actually a new uh avenue that I'll be exploring. So we'll see. 
you've written several songs about very specific people in your life, from your daughter to your husband to your parents. Have you ever written a song so personal that you only wanted to play it for the person that you wrote it for? I mean, the only song that was kind of like that was this song, Dinner at Eight, that I wrote for my dad, which I did play for him first Hmm. um, because it was pretty brutal. I mean, in the end, it was a love song, but it was, you know, I was, it's an intense piece. And there is kind of a beautiful story where, you know, I made the, I made the point of playing it for him first, just before the, it was released. And, and, uh, and he was very kind of matter of fact about it, approved and said, oh, this is a very good song. And it was, there, it wasn't like this emotional moment at all when I played it, though I heard that later on, he when he was at one of my shows listening to it, he was weeping. So it wasn't something that we that we shared personally, but but it did happen. So there's that. I will say, sadly, there's some mean songs <laughs> that I've written about certain people. That's a political conundrum. Uh, how to deal with that? So right, I'd love to sing it to them to their face. <laughs> you know, maybe you'll get a chance. Right. Who knows? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of Speaking Soundly. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends about it. Spread the word. Be sure to follow, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up on future episodes, follow us on Instagram at speakingsndly and visit our website, artfulnarrativesmedia.com. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist speaking soundly. 